You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 446. The best education in film is to make one. Stanley Kubrick. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook and of course audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film B I Z book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook and Contact to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, today we have returning champion Stephen Follows. Many of you might remember Stephen as the data man, the man who crunches the film data like nobody else in the world. And he has been on the show multiple times. And my favorite episode, of course, is when we finally proved for once and for all that Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie of all time. And we looked at the numbers to prove it. Now, Steven's back on the show because he has launched a new website called VOD Clickstream. And what he's done is remarkable. He has been able to go inside of Netflix to see what is actually going on in all of their data. He's been able to come up with answers for questions like, does Netflix have a long tail? How do romantic comedies perform on Netflix? How do sci-fi films perform on Netflix? Did American audience stream international TV shows? How did The Office truly perform on Netflix? The platform, which TV genres are the most popular on Netflix, and so, so many more. When I heard about this, I called up Steven. I said, Steven, you got to come back on the show. We need to get this information out to the tribe because it's just, again, a snapshot of what Netflix was doing during the time of 2016 to end of middle of 2019, but it is better than nothing when before all that information had been hidden behind the walls of Netflix, but we have been able to get inside of that. Now, I do have to have a disclaimer for this episode. All this information is wholly independent research and is not affiliated with Netflix or any other streaming platform or studio. Just wanted to make that very, very clear. So without any further ado, please enjoy my eye-opening conversation with Stephen Follows. I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, Stephen Follows. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing very well. You say that every time and I'm starting to believe you. Well, that's what I'm trying to do little by little. Um, I'm building I'm building you up, sir. I'm building you up. <laughs> I'm delighted to be back and, and your audience are always awesome as well. Um, every time I'm on the podcast, people reach out to me and say, hey, I heard you. I'm part of the tribe. I heard you on Alex's podcast. Hey, I've got and the, every, every single one so far has been like really polite, but also with a really interesting question or perspective. And yeah, you've got a great tribe. So I'm always happy to come back. Uh, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and last time we were on the show, um, 
uh, we we did that Die Hard episode, which was mm-hmm. fairly controversial, sir. Oh, was it? Did you get pushback? <laughs> um, no. Uh, well, I mean, a couple people, a couple people. I, you know, I got a couple of tribe members who were like, really, Alex, an entire episode about Die Hard, and I'm like, yes, it is. But you know, funny enough, is that when I um, uh, <laughs> where I when I um talk to people now about Die Hard because now I'm uh, you know I'm I'm an evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> um i i go you know you know that hurts a christmas movie and they'll push back i'm like no 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 i have data <laughs> i have proof that die hard so i appreciate you doing the hard work on that and so now at parties uh, or at least uh, zoom meetings nowadays uh, i get to <laughs> i get to say no no i have got data here's the link and i send them to our interview and people just like amazing and i just you know, that's, really, that's always the thing you want to hear at a party when you're having a conversation with someone when they go no no i have the data <laughs> i know exactly it's just your life of the party you are the life of the party without <laughs> Uh, without question. Um, and then I just released uh, a link of the top 12 screenplays of unconventional uh, Christmas movies. And of course, Die Hard's on the top of that list. But I had Lethal Weapon on there. Um, what else did we have on there? Lethal Weapon, Gremlins, Gremlins 2. Oh, good night. Uh, which one? Is it? What's the one with uh, from 97 with uh, oh, oh, uh, Gene Davis? Uh, Long oh kiss no, night. long kiss good night. Yes, long kiss good night. Was it? Long kiss good night is on there as well. A, a, a bunch of a, a bunch of Shane Black, uh, a bunch mm. of Shane, a bunch of Shane Black uh, episode. Uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, screenplays, because he's uh, he just loves absolutely loves writing. I mean, I could argue Iron Man three, but I, I prefer not. Um, you know, Disney do do list that in on Disney Plus under Christmas movies. Oh, I, I, I genuinely uh, yeah. I genuinely don't know if they're doing it to try and stir up controversy or whether they genuinely believe it. And, and before we start on our uh, current interview, I have to li- I'm going to list off the, the, the list of uh, Christmas, uh, <laughs> Christmas, uh, unconventional Christmas movies. Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, mm-hmm. uh, wow. Gremlins, Gremlins 2, Batman Returns. Oh, yeah. Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. you, re- you really went there. I went there, sir. Yes. Uh, Edward Scissorhands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Long Kiss Goodnight. Bad Santa. Black Christmas. And mm-hmm. Krampus. Yes. Yes. All. Wow, all that's quite them. a list. That is that. That was. It, it took me a minute to put it together, but I had to. I had to. I had to. Uh, I had. To, I had to give them love. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 Stephen, man, I, I mean, I'm always so impressed with everything you do. Uh, I love you're just an insane, insane, insane human being. Um, in the way, and th- the same way you call me insane for what I do, I it's it's a mutual admiration because I can never do what you do in in 20 lifetimes. I don't think I'll be able to ever do what you do. Um, but I was, I was, I don't know where I saw it because you kept it, you kept this to yourself. I have to. I have to keep this. I have to. I have to give you props for this. Uh, you told me that you were working on something big, and I'm like, "What is it?" And he's like, "I can't, man. I gotta keep it. I gotta keep it quiet." And I'm like, "All right, fine. I do the same thing. That's fine." And then I, I think I saw it pop up somewhere like a few weeks later, and this thing called VOD Clickstream showed up. I'm mm-hmm. like, "What?" And I clicked on. It. I'm like, "What is this?" And I. <laughs> And I didn't co- honestly. I didn't connect that it was yours for a second, till I till because I, I I literally had no idea what this was, and then I went to the about and the team, and I'm like, oh son of a, this is <laughs> this is Stevenson. And I, I emailed you right away. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> What's going on? So can you tell? WTF? But yeah, yeah. So uh, so I did actually. I think I did. <laughs> like what the f? So can you tell the audience what a VOD clickstream is? Yeah, definitely. I'll give you the simple pitch and then I'll make it more complicated and nuanced because it's got some weird sort of qualities to it. But the simple pitch is that I've got access to a huge data set which reveals what people have been watching on Netflix uh, over a three and a half year period. So this is, yeah, I know it's it's something I've been chasing for a while and we can talk 
you know in a minute about the history of the whole thing but it's been something i've been chasing for a while and it's it feels it's like almost more of a mission for me than a than just a stats project because i i don't like that we don't know what's going on on that spot and i think it matters i think and i think it matters you know for your audience and my audience which are very similar like the studios must have a better idea than the average filmmaker and we don't have the kind of openness and transparency that we have on theatrical or in other areas and and crucially everyone's experience of s is so different my wife and i share a netflix account but we have our own profiles but no, they're so different mm-hmm. if we accidentally log on with hers i'm like oh my god it's all pink white central bullock and everything <laughs> <laughs> she looks up with mine and like, why is everything so sad and explodey? And the thing is, what that means is that even two people who like live together still can't get a sense from their own experience. Whereas when you go to the theatre and you see if it's full, you see lines, you know, you hear about it, and we have the same shared experience. So because of that, because of the uh, S word is so highly personalised, you can't get any clues how things are doing. And they started to release little bits more data in the last few like months and stuff. But compared to what we're used to getting on the box office, and, and even that's not enough. Like, how are filmmakers supposed to know what to do, what people want to watch? Like, what is this new realm that is dominating so much of the value chain and is only going to dominate more of it? And obviously, COVID and all that. I just don't know how else we're supposed to know to do this. So this is an answer to that, I guess. It's not perfect, but it's it's pretty unusual and I think really powerful. And we've only just begun really this isn't a project where i've launched a finished thing here's a report go read it it's like okay the work begins now so this is essentially the holy grail this is <laughs> this is this is el dorado for you as far as it data is, it, it, as far as data is concerned no it's, yeah, it's in, it, it, neither is the holy neither is the holy grail or el dorado for that matter <laughs> <laughs> I hear the Wi-Fi is terrible in El Dorado. <laughs> it's horrible. It really is. I've been there. It's not. It's not pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> is that why you left? Yeah. Yeah, I just left. I mean, I grabbed a couple things along the way, but I, but I left. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's like it's been really exciting, and 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 the volume of data and the complexity of the data is it's, a, it's an order of magnitude much bigger than I'm used to dealing with. So I, it's not just me. I've had some help from some amazing data scientists, and and um, m- most of them, I mean. Two of them have PhDs in theoretical physics. You know, they they deal with things like dark matter and and whether the the standard model of the universe as we understand it is correct or not. And then I start talking to them about like what we know about Netflix and and Amazon, <laughs> and, you know, and they're like, "Wow, we know more about dark matter. We know more about the origins of the universe than we know about what a film performed on Netflix." And I was like, "Uh huh. Do you want to like join the team? Let's figure something out." And uh, <laughs> You're so India, gonna, you're Indiana Jones, and you're putting together a team to go. They're, on they're almost all physicists. Like we're the team is more. I think it has more theoretical physicists than people who are not a theoretical physicists. And by the way, I'm one of the not. Um, <laughs> and so it's been kind of bonkers because not only are they very talented data scientists, but also they're used to dealing with abstract ideas and abstract numbers. And actually, you need to deal with that. I mean, we'll talk about this later on. I'm sure some of the ideas in how you analyze this get quite abstracted quite quickly because it's not as simple as like you know box office you say how much money did it make Mm -hmm. even that's a bit flat because you don't know if it was lots of kids or fewer adults or peak time or off but but, but generally it's comparative you you account for inflation you Mm -hmm. can sort of sort out with this data it's so much more complicated than that to try and get straightforward simple answers and so that's why they were so uh they just had all the right training for it um and it was just a joy to work with those just incredibly smart, talented people um, and just sort of see if we can do something interesting for the film community. I have a, th- I have a theory, uh, Stephen. I feel that the reason why people take you seriously is not only because of your work ethic and your talent, but I truly believe it's your, it's your, it's your accent. Because everything you say <laughs> – I have glasses so, as well, by the way. I mean, you, I mean it's, uh, it sounds so legit. Like if you, if you would like, listen, my friend, I have some land to sell you some swamp land to sell you in Florida, I'd be, continue. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that you have a voice for excitement. Let me tell you something exciting. I'll be like, uh-huh, I'm already on board. What is it? <laughs> so if we joined forces, Stephen, we could rule the world. <laughs> or we could ruin each other. Yeah, this, very true. Very true, sir. Very, very true. <laughs> okay, so how, okay, so you're essentially going inside the algorithm of Netflix? So, is, is that something no, like that? 
Not quite that. So, so this it doesn't come from Netflix themselves. There's no data breach. We haven't scraped it. We haven't taken it from them in any sense. Mm -hmm. What's happened is it, it utilizes this sort of type of data called clickstream data. And mm -hmm. what clickstream data is is that um, people have volunteered. They've signed up. They've opted in to install plugins and services and things like that in their browser and other things like that. And the the these let's say plugins are really useful you know they maybe they're a really good translator tool or they they just do a, a certain thing really well and they're free for users and the deal is that in return for that they the users agree that their anonymized history their, their click stream all the clicks they made essentially can be sent to a server and put into a big bucket and that sort of fire hose of millions and millions of people with their anonymized history allows us to to see what the journey they made around the web and so uh, the actual raw clickstream, which I don't have, which is the full, like it's epic amounts of data, you can imagine millions of people clicking constantly all around the world. Mm -hmm. That is so valuable to so many people in so many different ways. You, you know, you could get a sense of how popular something is before the, the, the quarterly re reports come out. You could see how mm -hmm. people are buying things on Amazon, all that. What I wanted was the tiniest slice of it. And I just wanted... Uh, I actually wanted all the uh, SVOD streamers, but Netflix was, for various reasons, the best one to go for. And uh, I've been chasing these guys for a while. And I was like, because I've known about this for, for a few years. And I've said, look, just give me access to the Netflix slice, netflix.com, because it could be really instructive and very useful for filmmakers and stuff like that. And um, because of the nature of the clickstream industry, it's a small industry that makes highly expensive content data. And so they were quoting massive figures, like, five figures a month, a massive high end. And it was just impossible. And then, so I've been talking to them every six months or so. I catch up and go, hey, have you suddenly sort of decided that your, con your data is worth far less than it was? And they're like, no. Nope. Um, and then around the summer of 2019, there was a sort of big um, shift in the clickstream data world where uh, there, was a, there was a sort of a, a perfect storm of a few different things. Like some of the browsers, the big browsers changed some of their rules about what their plugins and extensions could do and what data they could share. Generally, people were getting tighter on privacy. And so things that they were happy to share in the past, they were less happy to share now. Um, and just all these sort of things came together. And so the clickstream industry transformed and sort of what a lot of the business models they had imploded. And it, some of the companies are still around doing other things. But basically, it kind of that version of it kind of ended in the summer of 2019. And so towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, um, so the beginning of two, uh, 2020, I went back to them and said, look, you've got this now static data set and i i can't offer you loads of money i can't there's no i don't know if the value's in that and i can't do much with it but i i know that it's fascinating and and for filmmakers and could be very instructive um please can you basically give me the 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 netflix data so i worked out a deal with them which didn't which was possible to do mm -hmm. and then uh so then they gave me about two-thirds of a billion data points and so Jesus. First of all, it was, it's just the volume is, is oh epic, God. you know, like it's just, and you know, they get, they gave me a sample. Uh, you can only have a million rows in Excel before it crashes and, and before it, you know, it won't load any more rows. And they gave me a sample of the data and it was like day one, hour one and Excel was like, that wasn't hour, but it was day one. And, but, and, and Excel went, can't, can't look at any more. And so, um, that, that volume is amazing because it's, it's really granular. And so what I ended up with was these are anonymized users so each user has a randomly generated id which resets over a certain period and i know what country they're in and i know what url they clicked on at exactly the time and the day and that's pretty much it like there's a bit of metadata but that's pretty much it and so in and of itself a click isn't doesn't mean anything but when you add them together you can infer meaning so you could say uh, this person clicked on the Netflix link that uh, is the watch page for a bit of content and the content's 22 minutes long. They waited 22 minutes and then they clicked on the next one. Well, that you can reasonably assume that they viewed it, right? Um, you also can see what people have searched for and things like that. Uh, so, so we have all this data. It, it has sort of three big limitations. The first is it's historical. So it, our data starts in the beginning of 2016 and ends in the summer of 2019. So it's like three and a half years. It's a shame it's not live. That's, everyone asks me, can it be live? And the answer is always sadly not. But if it were live, I wouldn't be able to get access to it. So it's kind of, it's this or nothing, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, 
Secondly, it's only desktop and laptop users, which Netflix say are about 25% of their audience. Um, and so we didn't know if that would have a skew or not, like whether people watch fundamentally different content on their desktop and laptop than they do on other on TV or tablets or whatever. So the first thing we did was that we went about recreating the stats that Netflix had announced during that period. So when they said Bird Box got X number of views or was the number one film within the first two weeks or whatever the, whatever it was, like any data point that they said in a press release, we would go back to our data and try and recreate it. You know, we would perform the same analysis and time and time again, we were getting the same answers they were getting. Mm-hmm. So because of that analysis, I'm, I'm very, very confident that the big picture we have is – a very, very good model of what they have. There'll always be mm. cases where it's slightly different or whatever, but fundamentally, considering we're starting with nothing, I think we're very, we're very happy with that. That was so a nerve-wracking you, period. So but, then you don't know how many people actually watch Cobra Kai or Tiger King? No, exactly. That's what's so interesting. Is So what we have is we do have a number for how many people within these panel of users watched it, but we don't know exactly how that scales up. So what we've had to do is if we had every single click on Netflix.com, then you'd have your your viewing figures right you'd have a raw number but because we we have a fluctuating panel and and we've had to account for like different factors like first of all over the course of these three and a half years the size of netflix's subscriber base has changed it's basically grown and it's launched in different countries the the number of people using these plugins and services has changed gone up and down and maybe they break into a new country or a tool gets taken off and so that's changed um and then also how you compare a piece of content that let's say was only available for one year in 2016. How do you compare the performance of that film with another film that was out in 2019 or something or 2018 or whatever? How do you compare them? Cause they weren't available at the same time. And so what we've had to do is basically normalize all of these views per day, per country, per type. What that basically means is for every single country we've said on this particular day, what was the most watched film? And then comparing all the other films to that film. So like film number two, the second most popular film got 70% of the views the first one did and the third one got 60% or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that then gives us comparable things because you can say within all the films that are available, how did each of them perform? And then that allows us to then create scores overall over this three and a half year period. So this is where the the scientists were really useful because they're, you know, comparing this content across time and space and different panel sizes. And the dark matter and and, and the the beginnings (laughs) of the universe and stuff. I get it, I got it, I got it. Okay, so, uh, (laughs) all right. So the last last limitation is that we don't have demographic information. We don't have IP addresses. We don't know age, gender. Like we know what country they're in, but that's it. So that's the limitation. All right. So, all right. So let's – Let's let's ask some some tough questions and see what you can do mm-hmm. to help us because the reason why filmmakers are listening is like we find this very fascinating how you're getting this data but how does this help me? Yeah. So, um, does Netflix have a long tail? Is that something that it, that you were able to come up, uh, get? That yeah, information? Exactly. that's exactly something we were able to have a look at. So the long tail idea was was made sort of most famous by uh, an article in Wired in 2004, mm-hmm. and it was this prediction based on the idea of growing digital platforms like Amazon uh, selling books and DVDs at the time. But the idea being that previously, when you have a physical shop, you make most of your money from the top titles, top 10, top 100, whatever, the ones you can have in the front of the store, right? And that's where you make your money. The concept of the long tail is that the way that Amazon in the future will make their money is actually through all of the other inventory, the other 100,000 titles, some of which that only sell one or two um, every uh, every every year or whatever, but there's enough of them on total, and so it becomes about the misses, not the hits, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so this was an idea that was put out there, and some people support it, some people don't. And how it relates to us is that we already know that the box office doesn't really have a long tail. Uh, we know that three quarters of all of the money made in the box office goes to the top fifty films each year. Like it's heavily, heavily skewed towards these top movies. So the other however many, you know, seven, 800 movies released that year are competing for the final quarter. And that is not great because it makes it very hard for us to, to, um, to compete. Cause we, if you're not big, you're nothing. Right. Yeah. So one of the first things we wanted to test was, okay, well, we know that the, the movie industry is already top heavy, already massively disproportionately supports the big films, but 
if we took on this long tail idea, maybe Netflix would be a place where lots of smaller movies would do well. Everyone watches something different, but it doesn't matter overall because Netflix are happy. And maybe that's our savior. You know, maybe it's a, a fairer space for us all to compete in and loads of tiny movies can equally uh, survive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a big thing for me to look at. And I got to say, it's disappointing, but not surprising news. Um, so basically, net, the, the viewing patterns on Netflix are slightly more skewed towards big films than the box office, mm-hmm. uh, which means that most people on Netflix are watching a small amount of massive bits of content, um, which was mostly uh, in the US. It was mostly Disney films like uh, Disney. They had a deal with Netflix, yeah. which is now finished. But that accounted for a huge proportion of Netflix's views. Uh, and it really was a problem for um, Netflix when Disney ended that deal. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of the, the the deals. But what I can tell you is that they lost their best performing content in a number of different realms. Yeah, and the um, office and the office as well got lost because it went over to uh isn't it on HBO Max or somewhere else that it got sold yeah, to? Yeah, well presumably it's Peacock because it's Peacock. a universal thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, and and so yeah, the office is it, the office is a great example because the office allows us we've got all the stats all on on the episodes of the office and because the off, all episodes of the office were available across our entire time period it's actually really easy for us to compare the performance of different episodes we actually don't have to worry about accounting for time and and availability and stuff and so we've actually used that as an uh, as a good example to look at how might the nature of svod viewing change the way we think about filmed content uh, what I mean is, right, so in TV, we're used to having seasons, mm-hmm. you know, because of the way that they're funded and broadcast and just the way that it's evolved, we are used to having a piece of content, uh, sorry, having, having a series that has got a beginning, middle and end, maybe it's got an arc across the season, and the beginning and the end of the season are significant, and then we wait and whatever. But that doesn't, there's, time is less of a factor with things like Netflix, like, it's not irrelevant, but it's far less of a, it doesn't matter whether it's summer or winter, you just watch them binging them. So when we looked at all the viewing figures of all of the episodes of The Office, we noticed a couple of really fascinating things, which is, first of all, the most popular season was season four, not mm-hmm. seasons one or two, um, which is kind of interesting. And I think it's about, that was where it really hit stride and where people start watching it or maybe where they rewatch it as well but we couldn't see if you have a look at uh, the chart of viewing figures across you know on the left hand side you've got season one episode one on the right hand one you've got the last one in season eight or nine whatever the last one was and you have all the viewing figures as a line sort of a, a line going up and down across across those two points you can't see where the seasons begin and end mm-hmm. you know they may make them as seasons but people don't watch them as seasons so it's much more like a podcast than a radio series right so you might think a radio series has got a a season and certainly in the uk the bbc have like okay this will be six or maybe 10 episodes of a radio series then there'll be a hiatus and then they'll come back whereas podcasts you just think are always going to continue right you just it's a it's a long stream of content it's like a soap opera rather than a mini series and that's how people watch the content and so i don't know how long it'll be but it seems inevitable based on the data we have that when people start making more content for Netflix, that they're going to move more and more to this sort of soap world where they're always making them like a churn, like even the expensive ones, it, it, from the way people watch them, it makes sense to just drop a new episode every two weeks forever than it does to quickly go and make 10 of them. I mean, the economics of the production costs might be different. You might want to film more in one location, but the production costs are not, a big concern if you get a netflix hit um so maybe we're going to start seeing seasons of indefinite length um maybe we'll start breaking breaking down like how long episodes are like i've just been watching um there's some brilliant comedians uh, called auntie donna australian comedians who've got a netflix series that's just come out which is incredible but they some of their episodes are like 17 minutes long and it's great because every second is great but they don't have to stretch it to 22 30 minutes, whatever it would have to be um, for TV. So, now, yeah. You know, so, so with with all this information, are, are you seeing, because I've been reading a lot that Netflix, you know, is infamous for just canceling shows. 
um, some of the people's favorite shows just get canceled and they're like, you know what? Screw you. We don't care because we're going to get, we're going to put out 20 new shows this month. And, uh, and they den- generally don't go past three, four seasons, you know, five. I mean, I think Frank, Ed, Grace and Frankie is one of the longest running shows on, on Netflix. Orange is a new black got canceled, you know, ended eventually. And, and it, they don't seem to care about letting things go on and on and on and on because they just rather just start something from scratch. And I think it's because mostly because of the talent costs and, and things like that. I was going like to say, I don't, I, I have no inside track on to, to, to Netflix and I, and I, the, the data doesn't give me all of what I'm saying here. So some of this is filling in the gaps or my opinion. Sure. But I, I would say that the cancellation for most of these things comes down to exactly what you'd expect, which is number one cost and number two, talent which is a related to cost because they are they asking for more money each season and crucially do they want still want to do it um i would, and obviously netflix are going to cancel shows that they um don't think are performing but they they could do with more content almost always and if you think about it what they actually really want it, they obviously want content that everybody watches that's amazing that would be great but one of the other things that's actually really important for their business model is content that's important to 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 some people like really important so let's say that hypothetically you and i both have a netflix account and let's say that you watch uh loads of different tv shows every every month you watch 30 different shows Mm -hmm. if i watch just two shows every month but both of us pay the same fee Mm -hmm. those two shows are that i watch are more valuable to netflix because if they cancelled those two or maybe even just one of them maybe i would leave but if they cancelled 10 of the 30 that you watch ah you'll probably be watched the other 20 and maybe some other ones so the 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 model that they're having to use here is Mm -hmm. not just not just the number of people watching it but it's how valuable they are to that particular customer audiences yeah yeah exactly so it's a that's what i mean it's a whole different business model whereas on television you're saying how many people are watching it and what demographic are they in like that's that's what's driving content on television um and what's driving content on netflix is different completely different and so what um i have to ask the question what does the lowly independent filmmaker how do their stats work i mean obviously you said that they're mostly skewed towards the big movies or big stars i mean i i I saw an interview or 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 an article discussing why adam sandler is one of the biggest stars on netflix and that's and like people like why does he keep making these movies why why does netflix keep giving him money why i mean like i'm personally a fan of adam so i love his stuff um uh, not everything, but I love most of his stuff. And the thing that they said was in the article was, was really interesting. And it made a whole lot of sense was the reason why, uh, Adam Sandler is, is, is given this, these kind of movies and these kind of deals is because when you're scanning through, uh, an SVOD platform, there's just so much content that when you see something familiar, when you see an Adam Sandler movie, you know what you're going to get. Like there's there's no mystery about like I think he just on this Halloween they just released a Howley something or other ha- Halloween Howley Halloween or something like that which was a huge huge hit they're gonna do a sequel to it because so many people watched it and it's the same you know it's the same stuff Adam Sandler's been doing since Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore but because of people's comfortability with they know what they're gonna get people watch and watch and watch. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. We see a lot of that. I mean, there's a lot of brands that do very well in a brand, Adam Sandler being a brand here, that does very well on Netflix. And I think that some of it is down to, is absolutely what you're saying. I think with him, there's also not that much competition. You know, there yeah. there aren't many substitutes. What's the Adam Sandler substitute? Well, Kevin James is in most of Adam Sandler's films. So, like is, there, so is David Spade. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> so, so there isn't a lot of competition. And I think that there's something you touched on there, which is incredibly important, which is that the way that people invest in the time they're spending watching stuff on SVOD is a lot more about relaxed time and not making a decision and stuff mm-hmm. like that and i think that speaks to why adam sandler's popular but also why it's the same films people are watching and they're watching the same tv shows again and again rather than watching new ones and i i think that actually doesn't help independent filmmakers 
because we're making stuff that doesn't have famous people, doesn't have existing brands, and more often than not is trying to challenge something. I'm not suggesting we're all trying to pass on a message or communicate it, but it's not the same. It's not the kind of saccharine stuff you might get from Transformers or a Disney movie or Adam Sandler, where you're like, okay, I'm just going to go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Most independent filmmakers are making something a bit spikier than that, and I think that doesn't suit most of the way people watch Netflix. Um, and so I think when you, your question about what is assuming that Netflix is is what we've learned so far from Netflix it applies to the other platforms and continues broadly in the future, I'd say that it's not great for selling uh, independent content uh, because first of all, what these platforms like Netflix want is the MCU. They want the Marvel Cinematic Universe because their people will watch it. They also can do one deal and get loads of it, and that will get most of their views. Um, they don't want to do individual deals. The audience aren't watching that content. They are the, they're the independent content, so there's not much of a drive for that. Um, and so I think that's not great. However, what I would say is uh, in the same way right now, I'd, I wouldn't invest in any of the companies that own theatres I would still invest in the concept of theatre going because I think people go on dates, they see their mates. It's a cheap for it's the it's the cheapest, most social form of going out with the lowest effort. And I think that what's happening right now, I mean, I, I just happened. I was reading a few days ago that Netflix have spent two billion pounds in the UK alone on content this year on production. So independent filmmakers might have many more routes to being employed. Um, than they would have had previously, as in if their previous routes were big movies or TV shows, they now have a whole new realm they could compete in. I don't know how I don't know how fair that system is. I don't know, but certainly there's got to be more ent more entry level people because there's just more concurrent more content being made concurrently. Oh, oh yeah, here in Mex here in New Mexico, they're 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 expanding. Netflix just got approval from the state to expand their studios. They they, they they're building out a massive studio complex. In New and Mexico. that's going to hire people. It's going to hire creators of course. above and below the line. And so as filmmakers, like that's – and also there are some interesting things. Netflix is – it's very easy to think of them as a studio, and they're actually fundamentally not. They are a technology company, and they bring a lot of different values into what they're doing. I mean I would argue that they are one of the, uh, the most forefront of HR in the film industry, human resources. Like they actually are able – Normally, when you if you work on if you're a below the line crew member and you work on six different um, independent productions in a year, you can expect to have six different relationships and no concurrent, no sort of handover really beyond a mild relationship in the sense that if something bad happens, you just try your luck again on the next mm -hmm. one. Whereas here, because there's a continuity of, of people being uh, at the, the higher end, you know, Netflix care whether there's a complaint about somebody. And this is great for things like sexual harassment or unfair mm -hmm. treatment or mm -hmm. discrimination. I'm not saying they're going to solve everything, but there is a continuity there. I mean, some of the studios have tried that. Warner have been doing that for a bit and Disney to some degree, but no one to the extent Netflix are doing this. So they are doing some things very differently. And as individuals, it might be a good thing. As people buying and selling content the way we're used to doing it, I just can't see it being better than it was because it's also an oligopoly. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not suggesting they're acting in any way to blister, but when you have five or six possible, maybe even let's say three or four, actually, no, hold on. So Apple aren't buying existing content. So let's say that it's Amazon and Netflix. Let's say that they're the only two that could, you could sell your content to in any big way. That's not going to engender, f you know, fair prices. And you're doing a single deal in perpetuity for the world, maybe, maybe. And so that's that's a simpler sale. If you get a good price, then that's that's amazing. But will you get a good price? Mm -hmm. And I also think there's some worrying practices. I don't think any of them are illegal, but I, I don't like them is all I can say. So, for example, I was talking to a lawyer recently who, who's sort of looked over a lot of uh, deals to one of the big streamers. I won't say which one. And this lawyer said, look, one of the problems is that part of the terms and conditions of the deal between the distributor and the platform is that the distributor is not allowed to tell the filmmakers how their film is performing. There has to be some sense of aggregation of the numbers and, you know. Yeah, so it's horrible. Th that not only is that horrible in a human sense, that is also terrible for that deal. And it also it stifles long term mm -hmm. growth. Like, how mm -hmm. can you have a sustainable career unless you get feedback and your feedback can't be we did a deal, but I can't tell you anymore. And that brings us full, full circle back to the 
um, VOD Clickstream because that's what we're trying to get a little slither of light in a dark room. Like it's not like we can illuminate everything, but we're trying to understand these things that filmmakers need, this feedback loop that needs to happen with the audience. Now, um, do uh, now are American audiences um, streaming a lot of international shows? Because I personally have watched a bunch of international shows um, recently because they've been popping up on my on my my uh, my feed. So I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. Oh, that looks interesting. And sometimes they'll they'll pitch me something. I'm like, yeah, no. No, thank you. I need, you know, <laughs> uh, and it just depends. Like, uh, you know, I'll watch subtitled movies, but not normally because I, I want to relax when I'm watching movies, unless I'm watching yeah. it for, for cinematic purposes. Uh, but if I'm just chilling, I don't want to read. I just, well, it, yeah. and also you don't want to be challenged. Like I, there are some movies that I would in a heartbeat recommend to other people that I've only ever <clears> seen <throat> once. I might see again once in the future, but only to introduce it to someone else or because, you know, some bizarre set of circumstances, yet there are bad movies that I will acknowledge that are bad that I, I've seen the Meg twice, right? It's, I've seen the lives of others once. <laughs> That's the wrong ratio. Uh, it is. It is the wrong ratio. And you know what? The Meg, I, I you know, I, 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 I watched the Meg as well. And it's just, a, it's a popcorn movie. It's, you know, it it's, the, my, it's the, it's the, it's the reason why I just, uh, well, it's the reason why my wife and I just sat down and watched all four lethal weapons in a row <laughs> because we watched the first one because I hadn't seen the first one in forever. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's so brilliant. Well, we have to watch two. Oh, we have to watch three. <laughs> well, well, we're, well, let's just, let's just go. Let's make it the, the all four. And in four days we watched four, all four of them. And we're just like, what's next? Let's watch Tango and cash. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I haven't seen that in 20 years. So it's like, I'm going, but it, it actually says exactly what you've been saying is I'm doing that because I know the, I'm, I'm comfortable. Those are comfortable yeah. viewing habits. And I'm like, oh, let me go revisit that again because I haven't seen that in forever. I remember it here and there, but I haven't seen it. So that is a natural response to being overwhelmed with content because you know yeah. that there are so many movies been out there. And if you had to create a list of how would you find brilliant movies you hadn't seen, it would take you seconds. IMDb score, meta score, sure. one the best screenplay. And there's loads of movies that you'd be like, wow, I'm sure I heard that's amazing. I've not seen it. But that all takes a lot more effort and commitment than most people are willing to give. And this is something that I think filmmakers really, independent filmmakers really need to either embrace or realize you're not going to embrace it and then find other routes. Both are valid. Like I, I'm not actually saying make popcorn movies. I'm just saying you can't make challenging movies and, and expect them to then survive in a mainstream uh, environment world, world, because that's not how people watch that content. Right. It's just mm. fundamentally. And, and I think the, the, the growth of content, uh, sorry, the evolution of content and the growth of platforms are massively interlinked. And the best example I can give you is, is outside of the film world, but is kind of um, makes a lot of sense, which is that the rise of Kindle, the Kindle uh, uh, e-reader, mm -hmm. was a massive part of the success of Fifty Shades of Grey. And yep. Fifty Shades of Grey was a massive part of the success of the Kindle because you could be on the train reading something, reading basically soft porn and no one would know. And both of those two things sort of coincided at the same sort of time. And, and it's not that all, everyone reading uh, stuff on the Kindle was porn, but it did mean that you could read private things. Um, and it's the same with the rise of sort of portable devices and podcasting. You know, these things are interlinked, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing, what we're starting to understand with SVOD is that people don't watch content in, in a um, curated way, the way that they might when they go to uh, a certain type of theater or they go to like, you know, they go to Draft House or they or they watch or they buy a, a Blu-ray of the Criterion Collection, you know, the considered, you know, cinephile way. That's not what people are largely doing on these big platforms. They're sitting down watching stuff that is comfortable, that is easy to understand, that won't challenge them, that they can pause when there's someone at the door or they want a cup of coffee or something. Mm -hmm. That is Adam Sandler through and through. Oh, you know? there, there, there's no there's no question. I mean, and the other thing is, like you're saying, movies that challenge you, you, you should also – you can make movies that challenge you, but you've got to do it on a budget. If you you know if you if you have any hopes of recouping that money, like you can't make a two or three million dollar, you know, indie film that five people want to watch. You, it's just it's irresponsible. So totally. there's the more you know the more like, it just makes sense. The more you spend, the more you got to recoup. But I and I totally agree with that. I think the other thing that I, I know you've been screaming at this at people for since way before Netflix, <laughs> but it's, it's even more the case now, which is you have to know your distribution route 
mm-hmm. before you make it. I'm mm-hmm. not saying do the deal because I appreciate that it's very hard to walk in a room and say, I haven't met, you don't know me, you don't know my movie and I haven't made it, but can I have a deal? I appreciate those kind of pre-sales that happen, but you can't hope that you're just going to throw it in with the, str- with the, with the sort of, stream of content and 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 including the streamers and it will get swept up and then it will rise to the surface it just from the data i've had i've seen here that just doesn't happen that's just not the case you can't write a book and expect it to be on the front page of amazon or in the in the front of the bookshops right we know and yet filmmakers still think if it's good enough it'll break through and i do worry somewhat that the way the SWOD platforms are working now, through no fault of theirs, they're just chasing the you know subscribers and the bottom line, is that it isn't, it doesn't reward uh, films the way that the previous system would to some degree. You know, maybe we'll see fewer breakouts. Maybe it will be that the, the where you really break out is on a much smaller platform, like for example film festivals whether they're physical or online or maybe it's um niche sites like shudder or something like that i don't know i don't have mm-hmm. data on that side but that is nowhere near the volume that netflix does or netflix compact you know peers so there is we all know that there's huge amounts up in the air partly it was happening anyway and then covid's accelerated and things like that and it hasn't landed yet but we don't yet know what this model will be for independent filmmakers. I am absolutely confident independent film will exist because it's not, it's never been supply and demand. It's always been supply, right? Where can I find the demand? And that's been part of the joy of like movies. They're not been made. Some of the best movies have been made because they want to be made rather than because they, I know, I know I already have a deal in place, but things are going to get tougher until we figure out what they are. But if I have, it's never been easy. And you look at some, you know, the crash of cinema tickets in the 1950s. You look at the crash of DVD and you look at the uncertainty of SWOD and all this stuff. They will find a way. I just don't know what that is yet. And it's not the one, it's not the easy one that's in front of us, you know? Um, and so you were asking earlier on about TV because we have, we have, data for movies for tv and for comedy specials mm. and for tv it's it's a it's the same pattern in a, in a different format so what we saw with movies is that the most watched movies by a huge degree are the big famous ones and when it comes to television what we tend to find is that it is the big shows but also it's the more familiar shows so if you go on if you're in the US and you go on Netflix uh, there's content from many different countries you could choose to watch mm-hmm. but what do people watch they watch it from their own country you know and and the generally speaking watch, yeah 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 exactly and and certainly if you look at the like the top shows like the top 50 shows are almost all produced in the US and you have to even the top 500 most watched shows not episodes shows on on Netflix over this period almost three quarters of them were US produced Um, the UK does very well but that's largely down to the great British baking show and uh, things like things starring David Atom I would uh, I'd have to say I've seen both uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but what I think is so interesting is that first of all, I was I was proud. I was like, great, these you know these Brits are surviving and competing against that. And I was like, oh no, it's two shows. Uh, <laughs> but there's an example. Like, what what this means is though, there's an interesting like thought process that goes on here. If you were being rational, you would say it would make more sense rather than trying to make uh, three films. Or trying to make one film that competes in three areas. It's quite good. It's quite scary. It's got some famous. It makes more sense, based on this data alone, to compress all of your resources, and that includes time and money and, and passion and whatever, into one thing. You know, do one thing incredibly well. And because of the power law and the, and the sort of nature of that, if you go from being the second most, po- the third most popular to the second most popular will mean so much more for you than going from fourth to fifth, you know, from, from fifth to fourth, um, that it would argue that it's better to make something that's extremely one thing. Um, and you see this, I mean, that we're in, we're recording this before Christmas and, and in look at how many Hallmark Christmas shows there are. No oh my God. Say they're good or well-made or enjoyable i'm sure one or two are but what they are is feel good christmas like they are absolutely that oh there there's are no for, and, and there's a formula and again the comfortability factor for a specific demographic of people um that's why those films generally have a mario lopez or mm-hmm. or um a dean kane or a face that people feel comfortable with because they remember them 
from, you know, they're just comfortable. They've watched their films or watched their TV shows over the years and they'll watch it because it's like, oh, you know what? I want to feel good. I want to feel good Christmassy. And oh, great. This is a new movie. And there you go. And all of us, like, I know that, I know that Mario Lopez Christmas movie exploded on Hallmark, apparently, uh, mm-hmm. because people love Mario Lopez because, you know, it's later. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, and, yeah, and here's, here's this thing, here's this thought that we, I haven't heard expressed very much. I'm, I'm sure it's not a brand new thought, but in, in the last 10 years of being an independent filmmaker and working with independent filmmakers and chatting to them, uh, I've heard people talk about, oh my God, do we have to hire people, actors who've got a bigger social media following or whatever? People are st- people have often complained, do they have to um, com- uh, weigh up talent and appropriateness mm-hmm. for the role on the one mm-hmm, hand mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. fame on the other? What I haven't heard many people talk about, but I would argue is perhaps the battle that we're going for in the next five years is in familiarity, not fame, but how comfortable are people with that person? So it's like, you know, one of the reasons that uh, George Bush got in over Gore was that people were happy to have a drink with George Bush. It wasn't about politics to some for some people. And I know this because I know some people that vote for him who actually, I think their politics are slightly strange. And they were like, yeah, I just don't like Al Gore. I can have a drink with Bush. And so when you think about actors it's not so much their fame although obviously that's not a bad thing and it's not so much their talent although do you feel comfortable do you think your audience would go yeah okay without thinking about it you know and that's why you look at actors like i mean almost every one of um uh, adam sandler's movies as, as a comedy to the point to which people have been watching un, uh, uncut gems and been appalled whereas mm-hmm. there are other actors who you just don't know what their movie is going to be because they play such a wide spectrum of characters. yeah tom Hanks. yeah tom hanks is tom hanks like he'll, he'll play yeah. everything you know he's that's definitely not brand. adams yeah it's his brand but that's fine and and but you also feel comfortable within tom hanks or with meryl streep meryl streep plays everything she's going to be in a musical this month on on netflix but yet you know she she also is on hbo max doing another film with steven soderbergh and you know she 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 does everything but that's her brand you think, and you feel comfortable you with her actor- I studied this a while ago. I studied on my blog like how broad the act, the the roles that actors had played across genres, and I found Adam Sandler was the most siloed. He most of his films have been in one genre, and the the actor oh, I only looked at sort of a couple of hundred really big actors, but the actor I, I saw that who had the broadest, as in like who had the least siloed in mm-hmm. one genre, was Ron Perlman. Yeah, you know, <laughs> any uh, you take there's no one genre that accounts for more than a third of a the roles he's done so he's done some comedy but he hasn't done mostly comedy he's done some kid stuff he's done some horror he's done some fantasy and so ron perlman is an example here who i think is a terrific actor and seems like a good bloke he is a perhaps a metric slightly less attractive to hire because he doesn't have that whatever we're going to call it comfortability factor um whereas someone like adam sandler who i would i'd rather see ron perlman take on ron perlman take on some certain drama roles over adam sandler but adam sandler would be a more comfortable watch for more people so i don't know what we'll do with that interesting it's it's very interesting the way this whole this whole thing is but i i'm really i'm really happy that you're doing what you've done um with v- with vod clickstream uh and i'm i'm just impressed like i always am with everything <laughs> you do man you're insane for what you do and i know that you're going to be digging through that data and continually uh grow and and build yeah, out more started. of a data yeah you just started, just started to go through that and that's a good it's it's not exactly what's going on but man it's it's more than we had before and it's definitely a direction to aim at it, it might not be pinpoint mm-hmm. but man it's better than you know like hey i'm going to go throw a football in, into a stadium i have no <laughs> idea where it's going to now at least you'll get it on the field and maybe well, you could exactly. even get it within a few yards you know maybe and that's the goal and also, you know, filmmakers should use all of these data points and all of these things they hear and then they know themselves and they talk, they hear on your podcast interviews. All of these are things you need to weigh up yourself and weigh them against everything else. No one person or one system can tell you what to do. And I'm just glad that we have at least one set of signals about SVOD that doesn't come from the PR department 
on yeah. the platform. Well, and I and I appreciate you uh, fighting the good fight, sir, and getting this information to the filmmakers. Where can where can people go and uh, get this info? So it's at vodclickstream.com. It's entirely mm-hmm. free. You, um, if you want to read more than the beginning of the articles, you need to sign up. But it's free. But that's the reason we put that barrier in is that we have got forums that anyone can join, and we wanted to make sure that. There was a, there was some effort you had to put in, and that effort is signing up and accepting your email address. Um, and w- what that means is that we have forums where people can post suggestions because we're still working out what to do with all of this data. You know, some of it we have plenty of ideas and we're churning away at them. But then there's some deeper things that um, we don't know what to look at yet. And my, the best suggestions uh, for the research I've done over the years have come from audiences. Like it's, if, if I was to think of the sort of most exciting things I've studied, they almost all of them come from audience suggestions. So that's what we're looking to have is like, what have you always wanted to know about SVOD? Uh, I can't give you an immediate answer and I might not be able to answer it at all, but I may probably I'm, a, I'm the best shot most people have. And I'd be delighted to follow those threads and suggestions that we've had from people. Well, man, I appreciate everything you do, Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to, we have to come back on uh, the show uh, and, and talk about our 12 unconventional Christmas uh, movies <laughs> uh, and do another episode next year. But I, I, uh, I appreciate uh, everything you do, brother. Thanks again uh, for coming on and, and sharing very valuable knowledge with uh, with the tribe, man. So thanks again. Thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Stephen for coming on the show and dropping the knowledge data bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Stephen. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to check out the free service VOD Clickstream, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 446. And if you haven't checked out Stephen's amazing crowdfunding masterclass on IFH Academy, you are missing out. If you have or are thinking of creating a crowdfunding campaign for your film or project, you need to watch this. He has studied thousands upon thousands of successful film crowdfunding campaigns and has laid out everything you need to have a successful one. If you want to check that out, head over to ifhacademy.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 